Elhamdülillahi Rabbil Alemin Ve salatu ve selam Ala seyyidin ve selin nebiyyine Muhammed Ve ala alihi ve sahbihi ecma'in Ve asıl Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala That he wants us to feed and success That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala makes this as a gathering Of blessings And that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala allows us to get closer to him And understand his speech And that he makes it as a proof for us Not against us Barakallahu uh, feekum, hayyakum Allah, jazakum Allah khair for having me and your good thoughts in me. Uh, this is another blessed occasion where I'm able to sit amongst you and hopefully we can benefit from one another. And that's very important because my sessions are not one way. I'll be asking you several questions and I'm going to start off with a question in a minute. But just to introduce the topic, the topic for today's lecture is the tafsir of Surah Al-Fatiha. Now many of the ulama, obviously, because it's so important, because the topic of tafsir is so broad, uh, you will find the ulama throughout the ages making tafsir of the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is the way of the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, where he explained the book to his companions, or the ulama anhum, and then the companions explaining, and then the tabi'in explaining, and then that continuation until the day that we live in today. Therefore, if a person was to look at tafsir of any part of the Qur'an, it is a sea without a shore. But what we do have here is one of, I would feel, is one of the best tafsir, especially from the contemporary ulama, which is the tafsir of Shaykh Muhammad al-Allama ibn Uthaymeen rahimahullah. In his tafsir, what he does is he summarizes the benefits he gives us principles and it's very easy and concise and it's digestible. It's very easy for people to understand. And this is what we have chosen for today's lecture, which is Tafsir Surah Fatiha. And then Allah, I'll be visiting again next week and we'll be looking at the Tafsir of Ayatul Kursi, inshallah, from the Shaykh again. Before we start Tafsir, the topic is Tafsir. What is Tafsir? Yes. So, uh, an explanation? Explanation of what? Either like a hadith or Quran. Good. Linguistically, tafsir means kashf and al mughatta, something. So, tafsir is to take off the lid of something, so to speak. So, it is an explanation, it is uncovering, it is exposing towards something. But in the istilah, in the technical terminology, the ulama have said that tafsir bayan ma'ani of Qur'an and Kareem. Or bayan ma'ani kalam Allah. It is an explanation of the meanings of what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has said. It is an explanation of the meaning of the Qur'an. Now, before we go into tafsir here, and again, this, like I've said, tafsir is extremely broad. And usul al-tafsir, which are the principles of tafsir, is extremely broad in itself as well. But it's important that we allude to some of these principles in the usul al-tafsir in order for us to understand the tafsir. There is nothing which is important of knowledge except that it has principles in our dunya and in our deen as well. If a person wants to study medicine, for example, you're not going to say, well, just go to a doctor and learn. There are certain principles that need to be established before that person has expertise in what he is trying to study. And the Qur'an is no different to that. And the reason why, and I'm sure uh, we are all aware of this, and this resonates with us all, which is that the speech of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is uncreated. If the person is going to say, well, I'm going to give you tafsir about the speech of Allah, or as some of the ulama have defined tafsir as murad Allah, بِكَلَامِهِ Meaning the intent of Allah with his own speech. This person now is engaging in a topic which is extremely, extremely sensitive. Because what he is saying is, the meaning of Alhamdulillah Rabbil Alameen ar The reason why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has revealed these ayat, I'm going to tell you exactly why he has said that. And exactly the reason as to why he has said it. And nobody, nobody, in our right mind, would say, well, I'm in a position to talk on behalf of Allah. Therefore, as a principle, we have to understand what tafsir is, and as a principle connected to the definition of tafsir, which is that the tafsir 
of the speech of Allah is something with the ulama known as a tawqifi. And tawqifi basically means is that the person can only speak of the book of Allah when he has evidence, when he knows what he is talking about. Now this is very important because quite often on the tongues of people, people will say, well, Allah says in his book, or the Prophet ﷺ said in a hadith, and we don't really know where that is, we don't really know what we're referring to, we just think it's there, so we say it. This is extremely dangerous. Abu Bakr al-Siddiq, the best of this ummah after the Prophet ﷺ, he said, Ayu sama'n which sky can cover me? Wa ayu ardn tahminani, which earth can hold me? If I was to speak of the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, fi ma'na, about which I have no knowledge of. Meaning, where am I going to hide? Where am I going to hide? Which sky can protect me? Which earth can hold me if I was to speak about one ayah? This is Abu Bakr as-Siddiq So how about us who are far less than him, who have come far, far away chronologically, away from the Messenger of Allah Wasallam and the time of revelation? So it's very important for us to understand because there are so many people today offering tafsir. Just go onto YouTube, you'll find plenty of people. Some people have millions and millions of people are following them. And they're making tafsir, and we don't know whether they're actually following tafsir from an alim or otherwise. I mean, this introduction can be lengthy, but I just want to mention one other thing when it comes to tafsir and the usul of tafsir, which are the principles of tafsir, which is tafsir has different approaches. So some books of tafsir, such as the tafsir al qurtubi will be a fiqhi tafsir. Not to say that he won't give you the meaning, according to what is correct, but his focus will be on, okay, well, what fiqh, what practical aspects can we derive uh, from the meanings? Some of them will be linguistic. So alhamd means something. Allah means something. Rabb means something. Al-Alameen means something. So they'll be just looking at the more linguistic sort of aspect of tafsir. Doesn't mean it's wrong, but that's an approach. Then you've got other tafsir which are ishari. Now this gets a little bit sticky and it gets a little bit dangerous even. Where they will say, for example, I'll give you an example. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says to Musa alayhi salam, فَقْلَعْنَا عَلَيْكَ إِنَّكَ بِوَادِ مُقَدِّسِ تُوَى You are in a blessed land, in a blessed valley, take off your shoes. From the people of Tafsir Ishari, they will say, look, what this means is take off your shoes because your shoes are impure. That is actually the meaning. That's why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala told him to take off his shoes. But now here's the Ishara. Ishara basically means something that the ayat are alluding to. If you like, hidden meanings. So they will say, oh, look, he's telling him to take off his shoes so that Musa can become one with Allah. Is that the meaning of the ayat? So now this is what I'm trying to say to you. There's so much that's out there that's existed from a foretime, which now, I mean, I would say just very recently in the last few decades that people are now talking about tafsir in the English language, which we probably didn't have beforehand. And it's just become a fitna. So as a principle, we have to understand, like we've just said here before, tafsir is to say that this is the meaning of what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala from above his arsh when he revealed it to the Messenger of Allah sallam, what he meant by it and the reason why he revealed it. This is tafsir. Kashf ma'ani bil Qur'an wa kashf ma'ani bi kalam Allah or murad Allah bi kalam. Something similar, I mean, there are different definitions that have been given. Tafsir, when we understand that, then we have to then understand that tafsir is tawqifi. Because if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reveal it, we can only speak about Allah with what he has said as to why he revealed it and what he meant by it, or his Messenger of Allah in the way that he conveyed it, or the companions in how they heard it from the Messenger of Allah But then the third thing here is that when we're living in so much of a, of a time of fitna and confusion where so many people are saying, these are the different ayat, and, these are, and it's not just tafsir, I mean, it's just the religion in general. How do we then protect ourselves and solve this situation? The ulama have said that there is a type of tafsir which is athari. What does that mean? Athar means the narrations. Therefore, the focus on us understanding the speech of Allah goes back to the narrations. Alhamd refers to something because it has been narrated to us from the salaf. The meaning of the name of Allah itself 
refers to something because it has been narrated to us, not that we're looking at it from a linguistic point, not that we're looking at it from an Ishari point, that there are some hidden meanings, etc. And this is the way that the person can be saved, not only in his understanding of the tafsir, but in his religion as a whole. That was the introduction. I feel that introduction is very important before we talk about tafsir of any ayah, any surah. But here today we're talking about surah al-Fatiha. Why is surah al-Fatiha? You might need a translation of the Qur'an for today's lesson and maybe even next week's lesson because tafsir is very important. You can't just think about, okay, this is the first. I mean, Fatiha may be a bit more flexible because everybody does it on a daily basis. But I will course see another uh, ayat and surah. Uh, I always recommend that even if it's on your phone that you have your app out so that you can follow what we are going through. Um, Surah Al-Fatiha. Why is it called Al-Fatiha? Yes. It is the opening of the book. The reason why Surah Al-Fatiha is called Surah Al-Fatiha because it is the opening of the book. Pretty straightforward. There's another benefit here from Al-Uthaymeen Rahimullah. إنها تشتمل على مجمل معاني القرآن في التوحيد والأحكام والجزاء and then he goes on to the rest of his speech the reason why it's called the opening why is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala decreed that this is going to be the opening of the book what they mean that this is actually from the Athar Hassan al-Basri and others Hassan al-Basri he says similar to what what they mean is saying here I'm going to try to bring them two together but before I get the narration from Hassan, the Shaykh is saying here, Fatiha is the opening of the book. And the reason why it's the opening of the book is because it incorporates all of the meanings of the Qur'an in those seven ayats. When it comes to Tawheed, when it comes to Ahkam, when it comes to reward and recompense, when it comes to the path, or Turuq Bani Adam, the path that the children of Adam choose to take for themselves. And then he goes on. He said that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has revealed revelations from before the Qur'an. All of those revelations can be found in the Qur'an. And the reason why is because the Qur'an abrogates everything that came from before. So there is nothing that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has revealed from the Torah or the Injil or the Zubur or the Suhuf or anything else that's been given to any other prophet or messenger except that the contents of it you will find it in the Qur'an. Either the goodness of it or the abrogation of it from beforehand. But now, similar to what he says here, Hassan al-Basri, rahimahullah, he says that the whole of the Qur'an can be found in Surah Al-Fatiha. So the whole of all revelation can be found in the Qur'an. And the whole of the Qur'an can be found in the Fatiha. Can we see now the importance of this Surah? Can we see now how when a person is reciting this, not only is it a du'a, but this is actually about the revelation of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala with anything that he has ever revealed to mankind. In Al-Fatiha. Right. Another name for this surah. We have Al-Fatiha. The ulama said they are up to nine. The shaykh doesn't give us all nine. But let's see if we can get some of them as to what the shaykh has mentioned. Yes, at the back. Um Al-Quran. Excellent. That's exactly what I've got here next. Um Al-Quran. Um al-Qur'an or Um al-Kitab, so that's two, so we're on three now. Um al-Qur'an, Um al-Kitab, meaning the mother of the book and the mother of the Qur'an. Similar to the reason why we have just said just now. Anything else? Yes. The Hila, excellent. It is known as the Ruqya. This comes in a narration of Abu Musa and others that they were traveling. And they wanted to benefit from sheep that was there because they were traveling. These sheep belonged to the kuffar. So they said, no, we're not going to give you anything. So said, what can we do about it? Not long after they parted, one of their people got bit by a scorpion. Got bit by a scorpion. So they came back to the believers, to the companions, and they said, this is what's happened. Can you help us? So they said, yes, we will help you on the condition that we can benefit from your sheep. This is now Dalil, side benefit, to say that you can take payment for Ruqya. Now, I just want to digress a little bit. The ulama have said that if there is a need, number one, for you to take payment for what should be normal acts of worship, then you can do so if there is a need. 
And number two, that taking of payment should be in exchange for the service that you have done rather than, how can we put it? Rather than it being an ujra, rather than it being like you say, well, it's an hourly rate. So if you say, for example, I will teach you the Qur'an, but for my time, I need, you know, £10 an hour or something like that, if there is a need, that's the first condition. But if you say every single ayah that I teach you is £10, you see the difference there. So now the ulama have used this to say that yes, you can charge for ruqya, yes, you can use this to charge if there is a need. So now they had a need because they were hungry and thirsty. So they went to the person that had been afflicted and they recited Fatiha and they went back to the Messenger of Allah and they said, Mary, did he, how did you know that this is a ruqya? It's a ruqya. And it's one of the most powerful ruqyas. And Uthaymeen, rahimahullah, says elsewhere, that if a person is affected by the Qur'an, if a person recognizes that this is the speech of Allah, it's not the speech of man, it's not created. If the person has yaqeen with these three conditions, all of the things that we do as ruqya for ourselves, whether it's preventative or cure, a lot of people think ruqya is just cure, that something's got, somebody's got something wrong with them, then we go to a raqi. No, we do ruqya all the time. Before you go to sleep, the Messenger of Allah says, used to put his hands in the cup. This is a form of ruqya. Uh, if a person has these conditions that he mentioned, that he recognizes that there is goodness in this, is the speech of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that he needs this help from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and he has full yaqeen that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is going to assist him through this recitation, this recitation will benefit. If a person thinks that in this ruqya, whether it's preventative or cure, that he's just doing it, but he's not really sure, he's not certain, then it's not going to have that guaranteed effect. So they did it over them, and the ruqya was successful. Therefore, the fatah is a ruqya, with these conditions that we mentioned. Another name, let's just take uh, two more, because we're on three, we're on four now, I think. We're on four now. Let's just add an odd number. One more name for surah al fatiha Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala calls it from the sab'a min al-mathani The seven oft repeated uh, ayat And again this is connected to what we have said before From the importance of the surah and what it contains etc But there is another one actually that, Here go on. Is it salat? As-salat and that's exactly what I was going to say next. Surah Al-Fatiha is called the Salat. <coughs> this is because in a hadith Qudsi, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, قَصَمْتُ salat baini wa bayna abdi nisfain. I have divided the Salat between me and my servant into two halves. Half for him, half for myself and half for him. When he says, Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen. Now check this out. This is really important. This is important for our children to understand, for every single one of us to understand this point. When you stand in front of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, because the Fatah is known as the Salat, you are actually speaking to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Now I don't think I've said anything here that you didn't already know or already reflected upon. But again, it's the issue of certainty like we've just said. In this hadith Qudsi, when you say Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala from above the arsh says, my servant has praised me. My servant has praised me. He's looking at you, he's listening to you, and now he is talking to you and he's boasting about you with the malaik. It's not like you're just standing there saying something and whispering like the kuffar do. They, you'll be standing in a queue and they'll start singing something, they'll start muttering something. Your remembrance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is not going unnoticed. You are actually conversing, even though you don't hear it, with the Rabbul Alameen. The one who has created everything and the one who has not created himself. The one who is infinite. The one who has been merciful and will continue to be merciful. The one who will cover you and expiate for you and the one who will reward you and give you the greatest of his mercies and his pleasures when you return back to him. When you say to him, Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says back to you, my servant has praised me. 
Ar-Rahman Ar-Rahim. When you say that Ar-Rahman Ar-Rahim, Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala says, "Athna alayya abdi," meaning my servant has praised me again. When you say Maliki Yomidin, Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala from above, look how insignificant you are, really. I mean, if you just to, I was on my way here on the satellite navigation. You just zoom out a little bit. Look how insignificant you become. So insignificant through Tawheed. Through Tawheed, you're not even a speck in Allah's creation. If Allah had done away with you and He wouldn't be unjust, that's the message of Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala. If Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala did away with all of His creation, He wouldn't have been oppressing them because we oppress ourselves so much. But constantly He is pardoning. We act from kafir. Constantly He is giving you a chance. When you say these things, Allah is praising from His servants who are not even a speck in His creation. The ibadah of the malaika supersedes us. The creation of the malaika supersedes us. The lifespan of the malaika of the angels supersedes us. Who, who are we? But when you say these things with ikhlas, with tawheed, with focus, with, as we will see, some of the meanings of the Fatiha, and this actually helps us, it's very important. A lot of people quite, quite often ask, how do I improve my khushu and my focus in the salah? Well, one of the greatest ways is for you to understand what it is that you're saying. Even if you don't understand Arabic, even if you know that, okay, in this surah, these are the meanings of it, and you will see that it will improve your ibad in a great way. When you say, Ar-Rahman Ar-Rahim, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Ithna alayabdi, he's, he's praised me again. My servant has praised me again. He's boasting about you. Something so insignificant. Maliki yawmiddin majjadani abdi. My servant has given me the sovereignty. Boasting about you and you and you and all of the believers who are saying these things to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. His own speech repeating it back. Iyaka na'budu wa iyaka nasta'een. Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala then goes on. So now here, these are the two parts. This is the first part where you are praising Him. Now we're moving on to the second part of the surah. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, this is between me and my servant. وَلِعَبْدِ مَا سَأَلْ Whatever He asks me here now, اِهْدِنَا السُّرَاتُ الْمُسْتَقِيمُ سُرَاتُ I will give it. This is between me and Him. This is between me and Him. هَذَا بَيْنِ وَبَيْنَ عَبْدِ This is just between me and Him. A conversation that has no intercession. A conversation that has no shirk. A conversation of ikhlas and sincerity and tawheed to him subhanahu wa ta'ala. Surah Al-Fatiha is also called the Salat. Now here, the Shaykh talks about this later on in the tafsir, but I'll just mention it now. This is now evidence to say something in there is a fiqh dispute. What is this being used by the majority of the ulama? What's the mas'ala? See if you've studied this before. How many ayat in Surah Al-Fatiha? Seven. In the translation that you've got there in your hand there. Have you got the translation there? Have you got the translation? Right. What is the first ayah? Every single translation of the Quran and all of the mas'ala to the Best of my knowledge, I've been printed today. Bismillah, Rahman, Rahim is ayah number one from the Quran. The majority of the ulama, the majority of the ulama do not accept this. The majority, despite the fact the way that it's printed, despite the fact that the way that it's been translated, the first ayah of the Quran is Bismillah, Rahman, Rahim. Yes, but is it number one part of Fatiha? This is the question. There is no doubt, and this is a jama issue that Bismillah, Rahman, Rahim is part of the Quran. But is it part of the surah? This is the question. So now when we make Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim part of Surah Al-Fatiha, this now affects the seven that we have said before, seven of the Quran al Because if you take that away, then we'll be left with six. And this is the dispute. The Shafi'i scholars have said that Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim is part of Fatiha in every single surah. So I don't know if you've prayed behind the Shafi'i scholar or Shafi'i imam before. They will start off, Allahu Akbar, they'll be quiet for a little while. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, alhamdulillah. They make the Bismillah audible of every single 
surah. So if they're starting at the start of the surah, they will make the basmala audible. The majority of the ulama have responded to this by saying, no, sabah min mathani, the basmala is not part of the sabah. This is what Ibn Uthaymin is saying. Dalil is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that the Fatiha is the Salat, Qasam to Salat Bayni wa Bayni Abdin Isfain, and he started off with where? Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen. So this is not evidence to say that Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim is not part of the Fatiha. Anas bin Malik, in Bukhari Muslim, he said, I pray behind the Messenger of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I pray behind Abu Bakr, I pray behind Umar. None of them began the Salat except with Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen. Nuthaymin adds another thing to this. He says that the Qur'an, if you look at it, it, it's got a flow to it. It's the speech of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. There's a balance to it. And this is a principle in itself. If you look at a lot of the Meccan surahs, they are short, the ayat are short, they are to the point, they are uh, predominantly on the topic of aqeedah and the akhirah. Al-Qariyah, Mal-Qariyah, Wa Ma Adraka Mal-Qariyah, Yawma Yakun, the ayat are short, etc. So Nuthaymeen is making the argument here is that if you say Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim is part of Surah Fatih, let's just say for argument's sake, Ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, Alhamdulillah Rabbil Alameen, Ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, Maliki wa Deen, Iyaka Nabudu, all of these are short. But then when you get to Ghayr al-Maghdubi alayhim wa al-Dhaleen, wait, 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 Salatul Adheen alayhim wa alayhim, Ghayr al-Maghdubi alayhim wa al-Dhaleen, it's now considerably longer than the rest of it. And also, so now he's saying here that the flow of it. But then added to that, the Qur'a, many of the people who recited the Qur'an, they stopped at غَيْرِ الْمَغْدُوبِ عَلَيْهِمْ وَلَا الضَّالِّينَ اِهْدِنَ السِّرَاطُ الْمُسْتَقِيمِ سِرَاطُ الَّذِينَ أَنَمْتَ عَلَيْهِمْ غَيْرِ الْمَغْدُوبِ عَلَيْهِمْ وَلَا الضَّالِّينَ So that's where the split is. سِرَاطُ الَّذِينَ أَنَمْتَ عَلَيْهِمْ Then غَيْرِ الْمَغْدُوبِ عَلَيْهِمْ وَلَا الضَّالِّينَ So this now name of Al-Fatiha being As-Salah helps us understand so many other things. Right, let's get into the tafsir of the surah itself. Uh, the Shaykh begins by giving us tafsir of the Basmala. Why do we say Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim? What is the purpose of us saying Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim? So we do it when we recite, but we do it in other things as well, don't we? So what is the purpose of the Basmala? Excellent. The majority of the ulama have said, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, the reason why we do it is for the purpose of al-isti'ana, which is to seek Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's assistance. So the shaykh is saying here, I mean, he goes on to detail when we're talking about the basmalah, uh, but this is just the benefit that I want to talk about, and then we'll talk about the meaning of the basmalah, which is the reason why we say Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim is we are asking for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's assistance before we recite the Qur'an. So, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, in the name of Allah, ikhlas and assistance, who is Allah, who is ar-Rahman, who is ar-Rahim, I am now beginning to recite, hoping that I'm going to benefit from this recitation. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, before I wear my clothes, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, before uh, almost any kind of action. There are so many different actions where the Prophet used to begin with the Bismillah. So the purpose is to seek Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's assistance. Others from the ulama have said, no, it's for the purpose of a tabarruq to seek Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's blessings. Example of that, when a person we're going to have the qurbani uh, not so long away, uh, the ud here, a person says, Bismillah, Allahu Akbar. So what's the purpose here? They have said, look, here you're doing it for the purpose of seeking Allah's blessings. So some of them have said that the reason why we say Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim is for the seeking of blessings. I mean, what seems to be the correct view is the assistance, but I mean, there's no way for us to say, well, let's just restrict one over the other. Bismillah, in the name of Allah, what is the meaning of the name of Allah? Allah subhanahu wa Ismun jalala. What does Allah mean? Yes. Excellent. Abdullah ibn Abbas, this is not here from the Shaykh, but Abdullah ibn Abbas, he says, Allah alladhi ya'lu ilayh. Al-ilah alladhi ya'lu ilayh. So now as you can see, even if you don't understand the Arabic, Allah, ilah, ya'lu, and all of these are talking about a deity, the definition of a deity that you are worshipping solely with awe and devotion. 
Now, had we had time, there's another issue that the ulama have gone into, is that the name of Allah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, is it a derivative of al-ilah, or is it a proper noun for himself, subhanahu? Meaning, is the name Allah, Allah, just Allah, and it has no root to it? Or is it connected to the root al-ilah? Right. Bismillah ar-Rahman. What's the meaning of ar-Rahman? Now, this will come in the fatah, so it'll save us to repeating ourselves. Ar-Rahman. What's the meaning of ar-Rahman? Yes? Most merciful, most generous. These are translations. But not necessarily the meaning. The majority of the ulama have said Ar-Rahman is the one who his Rahmah and his kindness and his generosity covers all of his creation. And Ar-Rahim, and again probably in your translation there, probably is repeated, the most beneficent, the most generous or something like that. Very similar. And again they're translations. The majority of the ulama have said Ar-Rahman is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala being merciful over all of his creation. The believers, the disbelievers, the, the man, the jinn, the plants, the animals. And Ar-Rahim wa kana bil mu'mineen Ar-Rahima. Ar-Rahim is something which is the same sort of generosity but even more specific for the believers. That he will accept from them, that he will protect them, in expiate, that doesn't exist necessarily for the rest of the creation. This is the view of the majority of ulama. And if they mean is saying here, no, he doesn't agree with that. Ar Rahman is a sifa dhatiya. It's a description of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in his essence. And Ar Rahim is the action of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala showing mercy. Now this is again, if we had time on the side benefit when it comes to aqeerah, which is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, does he have actions? Does Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala have attributes? Ahl sunnah wal jama'ah have no objection to saying yes, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has attributes. We affirm for him what he has affirmed for himself, what the Messenger of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has affirmed for him. Whether those sifat are dhatiya, which are connected to his essence in describing who he is, subhanahu, or al ma'nawiya, meaning the actions that he has. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala ascends. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala last night and night descends. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed his speech. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forgives. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala provides. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala creates to the end. al sunnah wal jama'ah, we say that these are the attributes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because this is how he has described himself or the Messenger of Allah without asking how. We know that it doesn't resemble the creation and that's sufficient for us. Right. This is Bismillah rahman rahim Last question, yes. I suppose you could accept both. Now, this is actually very important that you've raised that up. When it comes to tafsir, when it comes to fiqh as well, a principle generally in the Sharia. So the question is asking, can we accept both? As in, uh, we've said that the majority have said Rahman and Rahim means certain things, and uh, Abu Aliya from the ulama and the tabi'een, this is the view of Ibn Taymiyyah, this is the view of Thameen, that they have said Rahman is a description of Allah and Rahim is his actions. Uh, can we accept both? A principle in the Sharia is that if you can reconcile without them contradicting one another, if there is a possibility of reconciliation, then you should do so. And that way you are acting upon all the athar. That way you are acting upon all the narrations. So yes, inshallah. Right. Last question though. Why does Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the Basmalah have Bismillah or Rahman Rahim? Why is it not Bismillah Ghafur Rahim? Why is it not Bismillah Al Aziz Al Hakim? Why is it not Bismillah Samir Basir? Why has Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala chosen for every single surah and some of the athkar as we have mentioned Ar Rahman Ar Rahim? Yes. Because? It covers everyone. Yes, that's good. But there is something about the description of Allah Himself in the answer. But yeah, that, that is a good answer. Yeah, at the back. Yeah, because Allah is most merciful for all His servants. That's exactly what He has said here. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is merciful for all of His servants. That's why we say Bismillah ar Rahim. Yes. Is Ar 
Excellent. Excellent. Ibn Qayyim, rahimahullah, this guy is thinking exactly like Ibn Qayyim here, mashallah. <laughs> Ar-Rahman, Ar-Rahim are from the greatest descriptions that you can have for Allah. There is no other name or attribute except that it follows on from Allah Rahman Rahim. Now this is very important because we live in a world now where people are coming up with so many different misconceptions about Allah, about His Messenger, about the Deen. And they say, well, there's certain things that we don't agree with, there are certain things that we think are backward, all these different things. We all say, well, as an issue of submission, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has never, ever Legislated or given anything to us except that it is a mercy for us. <coughs> except that there is a goodness for us. So it's an issue of submission, so wholeheartedly, really, because he is in his religion giving us the utmost of his mercy that is not given to any other ummah before. And there will be no other ummah after. Surah Al Fatiha begins with Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen. What is the meaning of Alhamd? How are you? Alhamdulillah. Alhamdulillah. Subhanahu Rabbil Adeem. Alhamdulillah. I've just eaten. Alhamdulillah. We repeat all the time after our salawat. What's the meaning of it though? Now, before you say all oh, praises to Allah, that's a translation and I'm not going to accept that. <laughs> and there's a reason why actually as well. Because even that, I mean, what does that mean? All praises. Praises means I'm saying something good about Allah. But what does that actually even mean? Though? What's alhamd? Yes? Because of Allah. It's like giving thanks to Allah. Yes, it is like giving thanks to Allah. But I would say, as Ibn Taymiyyah actually says, that this is an outcome of the hamd rather than the meaning of the hamd and you'll see what I mean in a minute yeah. Yeah. similar to what he's just said there so he's basically saying that we're saying hamd because we are grateful but if you think about that that is more of an outcome rather than definition I'm saying it because I'm grateful but what's the meaning of it yes excellent he says here wasful mahmud bil kamal ma'al mahabba wa ta'zim وصف المحمود مع الكمال والمحبة والتعذيب. Giving Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala the attribute of perfection, the description of completion with, this is important though, with love and awe. How are you? Alhamdulillah. Now you probably can see how that completely changes everything in your perspective. The reason why it's been legislated recommended for me to say alhamdulillah in so many different aspects of my life is because I am praising Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for his completion with love and awe hence it is an outcome of my gratefulness towards him because all of the goodness that I have is because of his completion and I'm doing it because of love and awe towards him Therefore, the meaning of Alhamdulillah is to attribute completion to Allah. The Shaykh then says this has two outcomes. Number one, the believer then praises Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala with all forms of praises. Because it comes with the Al. And this Mu'arraf basically means, Mu'arraf in the Arabic language means the definite form meaning Al, all praises as you see translated. So basically what you are now saying here is, I am praising Allah with complete perfection. All perfection that ever exists that I know of that I don't know of, the things that I can articulate that I can't articulate, belongs to Him. All completion, all perfection, all majesty, all all. And this comes with love and all for myself. The Shaykh says, if a person was to have alhamd without the completion, without the mahabba, the love, and the awe, then that person is being grateful, but it's not hamd. So if you do me a favor and I say, thank you very much, I'm grateful towards you for the favor that you've done for me, but it's not necessarily accompanied by me thinking that you're perfect, or that the thing that you've done for me is perfect, or that I have this, you know, unconditional love for you which extends, 
or that I'm in awe of you because of the way that you've helped me. It's just that I'm grateful for what you have done. So the Sheikh is saying here, we have to understand the difference between praising Allah. This, I'm trying to like connect it to the translation that we've got. Praising Allah, being grateful of Allah, uh, thanking Allah. Because quite often a person will think, well, I'm saying Alhamdulillah because I want to be thankful. There's nothing wrong with that. But there's something more above that from the meaning, which is now you are attributing completion and perfection to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala with that intrinsic act of worship which is happening inside of muhabba and ta'deem, which is of love and awe. That's why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says alhamdulillah. Because this alhamd, indefinite, complete alhamd, with what we have described, what is hamd, which is completion and perfection and love and awe, can only belong to him. Whereas gratefulness and thanks can belong to anyone. So you can say technically, hamd to a servant, to a creation, but alhamd, in all of its perfect form, with that love and awe, can only belong to Allah, an act of worship, of tawheed, to him alone. Rabb. What is a rabb? Before you say Lord, not acceptable. Because now, again, in English, what, what does Lord mean? The owner of something? The, the controller of something? I don't know, what, what would it mean? Yeah. Like, it has a feeling of the creator, the provider, the sustainer, the owner. Excellent. He's nailed it right on the head. All four of those is what Ibn Thaymi, well, Thaymi gives three, but others from the ulama have added the fourth one. Number one, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the creator. The creator obviously owns. After Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created you, he's created now this human being. Did he leave it? From the moment that you were a cell, that you became a thing, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has been providing for you in your existence and he will continue providing for you whilst you're in the dunya. As soon as your soul leaves your body, does the provision stop? The provision actually intensifies. Inshallah, we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make them of those who are successful in a way that you have never been provided for ever in the dunya. Ever in the dunya. The provision has not stopped. It's just transferred to something which is known as the barazakh. You will stay in your barazakh for as what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has willed. The Messenger of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has been there for 1,440 years, roughly. He lived in the dunya for 63. What's the comparison? No comparison. How long left? No comparison. What is he experiencing of bliss and joy and elevation? Billions of people making du'a for Allahumma salli ala Muhammad. This is him, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, experiencing the barzakh. His ruh is returned back to him. This is him and his brother, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Does the rizq stop when the day of judgment commences? No, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will feed people on the day of judgment from water. He will clothe them. He will shape them. He will help them when they are questioned. He will help them over the sirat. And then the intent in Jannah, we ask Allah to make us of them. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will tell them to eat and drink. Eat and drink as much as you want. Rivers made out of water, rivers made out of milk, of honey, of wine. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala describes that when you take it, you take a sip, you look at your vessel again, it's still full. Rizq without ever ending measurement. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says it doesn't come to an end. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is your Lord because He created you and He provides for you, and that should be a lesson in it for us as well. That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala would not abandon you. Don't think for one moment that my risk is limited in the life of this dunya, that I need to choose haram risk over halal risk that my options are only just riba or whatever else it might be. Because Allah is your Rabb. And He didn't leave you when you were a fetus and He won't leave you when you are a shroud. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is your creator. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is your provider. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is your sustainer. 
What's the difference between provision and sustenance? Al Khaliq, Al Razik, Al Mudabbir. What's the difference between Rizq and Idbar? Yeah. It's the same, like, covers a lot more things and it's from, like, brings you up. Excellent. So now here, provision is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives you the provision, but there is an order to the provision. There is an order to the provision. So Allah provided us with the sun. But there continues to be an order to the provision. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has provided you with a body. Inside you've got organs. Inside you've got all these different things that are going on. After Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala provided you. So not only did he create you, not only did he provide for you, and he hasn't forsaken you, he continues to make sure that you have order in the provision that you have. Otherwise, what would have happened? You'd be left to yourself and there'd be destruction. This is what the Shaykh has said here as to what is a Rabb. But some of the ulama have added to that is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, a Rabb is the one who has the dominion and included in that dominion is legislation. Included in that dominion is... So now legislation here, we're talking about legislation in the universal legislation. So the sun will come up, the sun will go down and it will happen with the way that he has created it, it will happen with the sustenance, and it will happen with his decree. Man will never fly. Man, if he was to uh, put himself into water, he will ev- eventually drown. These are from the Qadr Allah al qawni that the ulama have said. This is just how the world is. This is from the legislation of Allah. But also connected to the legislation of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is religion. And this is what defines a Rabb as a Rabb, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is Welcome to lecture or to eat, mashallah. <laughs> <laughs> sure. Only just one, but he's giving me two, mashallah. Yeah. Okay. I'll have this though. Um, uh, so this is a rub. Okay. Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen. What's the Alameen? Mean? The world is good. Okay, so Alhamdu, praise be to Allah, the Rabb of the one who encompasses everything. Possibly, possibly, but the Alameen is a bit different, and we'll see what, yeah? Sorry, what were we saying? I was mentioning, like, in a way, kind of mentioning Allah's worship that He is the one who created everything. Yeah, I think it's similar to what He was saying that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has created everything, yeah? Excellent. What you're saying is right, but the meaning is above that, which is Al-Alameen refers to everything that exists, that is created. Alhamdu, or praise with love and awe and majesty. Lillah is for Allah alone, who is the Lord, the creator, the sustainer, the provider, the legislator, for everything that exists. Therefore, the greater meaning in the Alameen and the I in general, which is that Allah is the creator and everything else is subservient to. Everything else is the Alameen. Everything else is created. And He's the Rabb of it all. I don't think we're going to finish this today. So, should we just split it into two parts? Yeah, let's have a break. <laughs> we're just on the first time. <laughs> yeah, okay. The tea's ready, so you guys want to have a break? Should we have a break? Okay, if we can all settle down, we'll continue with our tafsir in the second segment. Um, the plan is to carry on for another 15 minutes, maybe another eye or two. Uh, then we'll stop for question and answers, then we'll conclude with the question and answers and we'll pray Maghrib, inshallah. And then inshallah, I think the plan was to do right, of course, next week, but... I think if we just stick to Surah Al-Fatiha and go through it with the pace and the detail that we've started off with, it might be more beneficial rather than hastening and trying to just start something new next week. Right. Here, I just want to mention something which is a really important benefit, going back to the definition as to what is tafsir. The Shaykh has given us the tafsir. And then he says, al fuwaid meaning the benefits from the first ayah, which is, Alhamdulillah Rabbil Alameen. The benefit here is, and this is again, I think a lot of people are confusing, especially in the t- day and age and the time that we're living in today, which is a lot of people confuse tafsir from reflections. Tafsir and lessons. And you might even find this with, you know, halaqat between brothers, maybe sisters with children. They'll read an ayah and they'll say, well, what does this ayah mean to you? What does this ayah mean to you? What is the meaning you think 
means to desire. This is completely wrong. Or a person will say, well, I was reading the ayah and I had a thought. And I am pondering. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala commands us to ponder on the Qur'an. The pondering is separate to the tafsir. The benefits are separate to the tafsir. Tafsir, kashful ma'ani, in muradillah. This is the meaning as to what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has said and the reason why he has said them. This is not a joke. This is not something that we can play around with because we are now talking and we are trying to represent what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said in what we are saying is the explanation of these ayat. The tafsir is one thing. The lessons and the benefits and the ponderings, whatever you want to call them, the reflections, all of these are completely separate. But the ulama have said that these ponderings and reflections must be in line with the tafsir. Otherwise, it's not a pondering. Because what you're thinking is not in line with the actual meaning itself. Therefore, there is no real correlation, even though you may think that there is a correlation. Right? This is very important for us to understand. Because again, you will find on social media and all these different platforms, people talking about the speech of Allah and bringing lessons and ponderings themselves. And it's important that we understand that the pondering and the reflections or whatever it is that we want to call it. People do this with social media a lot, isn't it? As in they have like posters and videos and they'll say, look at this ayah, look how amazing it is, look at the miraculous scientific nature. And what. Is it in line with the tafsir? If it is, then maybe, yes. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that there is a, uh, a barrier between the waters. And this is what the ulama of tafsir have said, and they've said that this is a sign of Allah, that we can say, yeah, fair enough. You can correlate the two. But quite often, people will try and make something from something which there isn't. So the Shaykh gives us benefits, and I think some of the benefits we've actually talked about. But one of the benefits here, he says that in Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen, we have a relationship between a Tawheed al rububiyyah with Tawheed al uluhiyyah al rububiyyah Tawheed, okay, Tawheed means the oneness of Allah. What is Tawheed? What do we mean by the oneness of Allah? I'm sure we've heard this word before, right? Tawheed. Yeah? Is there anyone who hasn't heard the word Tawheed before? Put your hand up. Alhamdulillah. Everyone, everyone knows what Tawheed is. What is the meaning of Tawheed? And before you say the oneness of Allah, again, this is linguistic. Not acceptable. Yeah, go on. Just uh, Allah alone without any associating any partners. Excellent. So now here, Tawheed refers to the rights of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala which belong to Him alone. Which cannot be given to anyone. Why do we say partners? Because they are saying here, you can't have a partner with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, let alone supersede. Let alone supersede. So if a person wants to say, well, I believe in Darwin's theory, now the billah, that man came from uh, apes. I believe in that theory, it originated from nothing. But Allah created something, or Allah created the rest of the universe, let's say, for example. This person has taken the right of Allah, which is al-khalq, which is creation. Let alone, you know, disbelieving in the ayat. But let's just talk about the right of Allah. Allah is the one who creates alone. What he has done is he's got the right of Allah and he's superseded it with a theory. He's partnered it with a theory. Not superseded. Partnered it with a theory. If that is shirk and that is not allowed and that would expel a person outside from the fall of Islam or his Islam wouldn't be accepted in the first place, then how about if a person was to say, well, I don't believe in Allah, now the billah, and I believe in Darwin's theory instead. That is superseding now. So that's why we often find, la sharika lah, he has no partners, etc. Because of the fact that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in these rights has no partner, let alone superseding, let alone just wholeheartedly giving the rights of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to someone or something else. This is tawheed. To give the rights of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, which belong to him, to him. What are the rights of Allah? There are three categories, known to all of us. ar which is lordship. We talked about what is a lord. Uh, creation, provision, um, uh, sustenance, and legislation. That now belongs to him. He has no partners in that. This is solely for him. And he has nothing that supersedes him, him in that. al uluhiyya or ibadah, tawheed al uluhiyya meaning that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is worshipped alone. And we're going to look at that perhaps now next week in Iyaka Na'budu, what is ibadah? What is the concept and the definition of ibadah? That's what we're going to come later on. But what we are going to say here, and I'm pretty sure everyone has a rough idea as to what we 
say what is ibadah. And again, ibadah is worship. That's the translation, but it's not a definition. So it's not acceptable for us to say, well, ibadah is worship. Well, what is worship then? See, well, this is very important that we have this in our, in our minds because this is what happens in the Arabic as well. So when a person says Alhamdulillah, that has an Arabic meaning to it, but it's not the legislative one, it's not the religious one, it's not the technical one. Ibadah is worship, let's just park that there for now. So what we're saying here, the second right of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is that worship is for him. And then the third category, which is solely for him, this is part of Tawheed, it cannot be given to anyone else other than him subhanahu wa ta'ala, are his names and his attributes. Those are his. He can't be likened. He can't be compared. He can't be imagined. He's beyond imagination. He's beyond comparison. He's beyond likening. He's beyond rejecting those names and attributes that he has given to himself. Because when you reject them, you actually attribute imperfection to him. So if a person wants to say, I don't believe Allah is above his arsh, subhanahu that he made his stuwa, I believe Allah is everywhere. Well, when you do that, in actual fact, what you think you're doing is you're, you're praising him, but you have gone against one of the aspects of Tawheed, and when you do that intrinsically, what you will do is attribute imperfection to him and not perfection. Therefore, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has names and attributes. And there are people from the creation that actually compete with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We were just having this discussion just right now, that there are people in your locality who believe that they have knowledge of the unseen. There are people who actually, in your locality, in my locality, it's everywhere. It's not only just like in foreign land somewhere, in a different continent. People actually believe that they are so pious that they are one with Allah. That they have the ability to exceed in their relevance, in how relevant and how important he thinks he is, to become one with Allah. I know what Allah knows. I have access to what Allah has access to. These people are actually believing these things. And the worst part is as the Messenger of Allah said that they are du'at linnar. There are going to be people who will be standing at the doors of the fire, calling people to the fire. In Bukhari Muslim, people are following them. He's a Mulana, he's a Sheikh, he's a Peer. He's learned, I don't know anything, let's go see him, he'll write something for us. He has knowledge, he has all these things. So they end up believing in him. They have gone against not only the rights of Allah in Rububi, and not only the rights of Allah in Uluhiyya, but also in Asma'u Sifat. So that third one is really important. A lot of people don't give it that much emphasis to it. They'll say, okay, Rahman, understand the meaning, Rahim, understand the meaning, etc. But it actually has implications in your aqidah and the way that you practice and understand Islam. The Shaykh is saying here, so now going back to the point here, he's saying, Alhamdulillah, who is the object of our worship with love and awe, Rabbil Alameen. He is your Lord, therefore he deserves your worship. Had you had a Lord besides him, then you should worship that Lord. But it doesn't exist because the Alameen is all created. There's only one creator. Everything else is created. So no matter what people are making partners with Allah with, they are subservient to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. They are poor and weak when it comes to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because they themselves are created. They are not a Rabb. They cannot originate something from nothing. They are not the ones that can provide and sustain and legislate in the cone and in the shark, in the universe and in the legislation. Therefore, when you understand that, that He is your Rabb and everything is the Alameen, it necessitates that worship has to only be for him. Extremely important benefit. Then the next ayah is Ar-Rahman Ar-Rahim. And we've covered this before. Let's see if you guys can remember. What are the two interpretations of Ar-Rahman Ar-Rahim when it comes to the scholars of Tafsir? We've got the view of the majority and then we've got Abu Ali from the Tabi'in. Yes? Um, so it's either, is mercy and his essence or is mercy in terms of his actions to the creation? Okay, so that's the view of Abu Al Aliya. Good. Um, and the majority have said. Arahim is his general mercy to everyone, and Arahim is his specific mercy to the believers. Okay, good. So now, Abu Al Aliya, and this for us is the correct view, is that Ar Rahman is 
As-sifat dhatiyya. This is a description of who Allah is. And it is from his names and it is from his attributes. And Rahim is from the actions of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It's the actions of Rahim. So here we've got a description and the action. The majority have said Ar Rahman is a general, all encompassing mercy. So the fact that there is goodness in the dunya, to those people who do not worship Allah, the fact that they have the sustenance, the fact that they are alive, the fact that they are laughing, the fact that they are being granted, all of this is from the Rahman of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Despite the fact that they're disobeying Him, despite the fact that they don't recognize Him, etc. But there is specific mercy which is for the believers and this is the meaning of Rahim and this is the view of the majority. Well, that we have said, what seems to be more correct is the view of Abu al and this is what the Shaykh is saying here in his, um, in his tafsir. From the benefits of this ayah, we'll stop here, I think. al fawaid what are the lessons? What are the benefits? What are the reflections? And again, he does this throughout the tafsir. From al fatiha he didn't complete the whole Qur'an, but Tunas, as in he did parts of the Qur'an, and he did Juz Amma. And this is what he does throughout. And you will find this from the way of the ulama as well. They give you the tafsir, and then they'll give you the benefits. Then they'll give you the ponderings. Then they, because there is a difference between tafsir and the pondering. And the pondering, as we have said before, has to be in line with tafsir. One of the benefits of the ayah is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we affirm, just like what we just said before, we affirm for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala those three in tawheed. Lordship, worship, names and attributes. Those names and attributes are actually a name for Allah and an attribute for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. However, now this is actually a thing, and there are people similar to the people that we've just talked about, and look at the audacity. They will say, for example, I don't want to get too technical here because there's a difference between aqidah and there's a difference between what they would call maslak and then there's a difference between what they would call fiqh. Matrudi in aqidah, chisti or naqshabandi or whatever it might be in maslak, in, in spirituality. And then in fiqh, I'm Hanafi. We don't have that. For us, Quran, Sunnah, understanding instead of salih. In your aqidah, in your maslak, and in your fiqh. In his aqidah, he will say, because the Maturidi and the Ashairah, they say Allah is not a Rahman. Allah is not a Rahim. Does Allah forgive you? If you say right now, oh Allah forgive me, they will say, no, Allah does not forgive you. If you say, oh Allah, provide for me. Allahumma inna ka'afu, tahibbul afu, fa'fu anni, laylatul qadr, they say that dua is not going to change anything for you right now. Excuse me. Why? They say it is impossible for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to do an action. Impossible. Why? Because if Allah does the action now, does it mean that he was unable to do it before? So when you say on the 27th or whenever, last 10 nights of Ramadan, Allah, Allah, you love to pardon. Allah, you are the pardon. You love to pardon. So pardon me right now in the now. They will say, well, if he pardons you in the now, why didn't he forgive you before you asked for it? When he knew that you were going to ask for it. Why didn't he forgive you last year? And pardon you completely last year. Why didn't he do that before? Why is he doing it now? Why is he not doing it in the future? So they said, Allah does not act. This is the, uh, the aqidah of the ashairah and the matrudiyya. So now look at this here. They will say, Allah is not a Rahman. Allah is not. This is why the Shaykh is saying this here. We affirm Allah is a Rahman Rahim. But the audacity. He will say, Allah is not a Rahman Rahim. He doesn't act. But me, I can become one with Allah. What religion is this? Is this what the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam came with? Ibn Taymiyyah says that this is akfar than the Nasara. This is actually even more kufr than what the Nasara believed. Because the Nasara actually believed that these things happened with one man and he became the son of God, not for everybody else. But this man in Luton and this man in St. Albans and this man in Leicester and this man in London, and everyone seems to have a share in what they're saying that Isa Alayhi had a share in. To the point here, the Shaykh is saying, Ithbat, Hadain, Ismain, Al Karimain, these two names, which are honorable, which is Ar Rahman, Ar Rahim, are specific for him. We affirm them for him. They are attributes of him. They are describing who he is. These are names for him. These are attributes for him, subhanahu wa ta'ala. And that, Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen, is followed by Ar Rahman, Ar Rahim. 
that he is your Rabb, a Rabb of Rahm. Anna al-Rububiyya, that the Lordship of Allah Azza wa Jal, Mabniya, is based on the foundation, ala rahmatin wasi'ah. Is based upon a mercy that is extremely vast. Lil khalqi wasila. And every single one of his creation attain it. Last point though, and this is a question I want to ask you now. How much of the mercy do we have access to right now of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Hadith Sahih, yes. One part of 99. All of the goodness, all of the beauty, all of the pleasure, all of the provision, all of the happiness, all of the good things that you can think that exist inside this creation are just one share of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's mercy. He has stored 99 for the day of judgment. And then on the day of judgment, the Ummah of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam will be elevated upon everybody else. وَكِذَلِكَ جَعَلْنَاكُمْ أُمَّةٌ وَسَطًا لِتَكُونُوا شُهَدَاء لِلنَّاسِ So that you be a witness upon all of mankind. 99 of his mercies. What is this dunya, akhi? What is this dunya when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has only just given you a tip of it? 99 has been saved for the Ummah of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam on the day of judgment. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for his mercy, we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for his pardon, we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for la ilaha illallah, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala keeps his firm upon tawheed, we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that he makes us of the people of the Qur'an, we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that he makes us of the people of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and that he makes us of his awliya in the dunya, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives us steadfastness upon it, we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that when we are questioned in our grave, we are questioned with Allah as being as our Rabb, and Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam as our messenger in Islam, as our deen, and we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for illumination when there will be a great deal of darkness when we will be placed in the grave by ourselves. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that he illuminates that position for us because only he can help us at that moment. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that when we are resurrected, barefooted, uncircumcised, and naked, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala shields us and he shadows us and he elevates us through his speech and through his tawheed, we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for an easy reckoning without any punishment and without any questioning. And we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for a safe travel over a bridge which extends over the hellfire, which is thinner than a hair and sharper than a sword. We will not get across that except through la ilaha illallah. After Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has shown mercy to us. And we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala through his mercy and we believe in him being Ar-Rahman Ar-Rahim. That we ask Ar-Rahman Ar-Rahim, our Lord, Rabbul Alameen, that he makes us of the first group that enter into his Jannah, attaining his Firdaus, being told, Assalamu Alaikum, enter, you have done well, Assalamu Alaikum, be happy, Assalamu Alaikum. For your patience, elevate, because this is now a place for you for everlasting bliss. هذا والله أعلم وصلى الله على محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين. I think there's a few minutes for question and answers, and like I said, inshallah, we will continue with our tafsir بإذن الله with the completion of the surah next week. Yes. Yes, go ahead. Thank you, sir. Majjalani Abdi means my servant has given me sovereignty, meaning he has made me the king. Majjadani, Majd means like sovereignty, like he has made me the king, he's given me the dominion. So when you say Maliki Yomid Deen, we're going to talk about this inshallah, the meaning of that next week, but Maliki Yomid Deen meaning the owner of the day of judgment. So then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, when you say that, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, My servant has made me the king. In what way? No, as in. My servant has praised me to make me the king, if that makes sense. As in like, Allah is boasting about the person who's saying it because his affirmation that Allah is his king. Do you get what I'm saying? Yeah. yeah. If a person is uh, praised by Allah and then they Sins and the major acts of disobedience 
the participants and thankfulness to the parents, etc. What could be the thing that they need to go back to to rectify that? <coughs> if the salah is not making a difference to that, to that So action, the question is asking here, the person is practicing the religion, establishing the salah, etc., but they are still falling into sins and acts of disobedience. <coughs> I mean, the answer to that question is actually very lengthy. But I will try and just summarise it with three pieces of advice. Number one, rectifying your intention. Recognising that the reason why you exist is to purpose, the purpose of the reason why you exist is to worship Allah. Understanding that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has created you for the purpose of submission to Him. And that any action that you do is between seeking his pleasure or not. And constantly reminding yourself of that. And this is actually the very essence as to why we study Aqeed and Tawheed. So that a person can have that firmness of sincerity and constantly have it reinforced and checking himself as to why he is here. When a person is doing things mechanically and they are not checking their sincerity... It is very easy for a person just to outwardly do actions, but it not actually having an effect in that person's life. And I would say here, the first thing that the person needs to do is check their sincerity. And the reason why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us in many places in the Quran, وَالَّذِينَ اهْتَدَوْا زَادَمْ هُدَىٰ وَأَتَاهُمْ تَقْوَىٰهُمْ Those people who are guided, Allah increases them in their guidance and He gives them taqwa. So how are you going to get that increase? How are you going to get that taqwa? Which is essentially what the question is asking is that, I'm doing good deeds, but I don't find myself abstaining from bad deeds, which is taqwa. It's because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying here that they had guidance in the first place, which is the ikhlas. So if there is an issue in the effects of the good deeds, then the person has to check himself, number one. (laughs) Number two, as Hassan Basri and others from the ulama and the salaf have said, is that our sins weigh us down. The effects of the sin sometimes cannot be measured. Let me give you an example. A person, na'udhu billah, and this is happening in so many different communities, and I'll protect your community, it's very prevalent in Leicester. Muslim young man, 16, 17 years old, thinks it's acceptable for him to get a knife and stab another Muslim or non-Muslim. First day of Ramadan, outside of the masjid, after Salat al Taraweeh, a group of young men started fighting another group of young men, and one of the brothers that was there, and I witnessed this myself, as in I was leaving, I said to the brothers, Akhi, you guys need to leave, this looks like trouble. And they say, Yeah, we're leaving, I'm a family with it, I left. Next day I found out there was something, another car rolled up, something happened. One of the brothers that was there, he said, Alhamdulillah, there were no knives and weapons involved. Otherwise, outside of the masjid, something, first day of Ramadan when the shayateen had been locked up. So now, here's the point though, here's the ibrah and the lesson, which is that this man, let's say he did something, he's stabbed another, another person, he goes to jail, he makes tawbah, he makes istighfar. Does that eliminate the crime? It can never eliminate the crime, he's taken another person's life. He's changed that person's family dynamic forever. So now the tawbah that this person has made doesn't necessarily rectify the effects of the sin. Ibn Qayyim rahimullah said that it's easier for a person to be patient with the desires and the sin than the consequences had he fallen into it. Therefore, the sin has an effect. Even if your tawbah has been accepted, it's going to change. It's going to make who you are. It's going to change your personality. And it's very important for us to understand that. that Before you want to look at something, before you want to listen to something, before you want to say something, before you want to engage in a way, before you want to have some kind of transaction which may involve haram, just think about that for a second. That You know that you're doing something wrong. Allah has created you to submit, which is sincerity. He is a Rahman Rahim. He wants goodness for you. If you fall into this, what's going to be the outcome? Even if you make tawbah and istighfar, the rights between you and Allah, He is a Rahman and He will forgive you. But the consequences are there. 
So you need to rectify that. How do you rectify that? With plenty of istighfar. Plenty of good deeds. Plenty of changing of routines and habits. And this is my third piece of advice, which is make sure you find yourself in an environment where there is goodness. If you find yourself in an environment where there is badness, then the sincerity more than likely out the window. The effects in you bringing yourself to account more than likely out the window. If the person is in an environment where there is goodness, then as uh, some of the companions he says, realize that the good deeds have sisters and bad deeds have sisters. When you have an environment of goodness, you'll be reminded to do goodness. And with that, not only do you now understand ikhlas and you're doing good deeds and you're staying away from bad ones, you're bringing yourself to account, but the shayateen will flee from them. And this is essentially what's happening here. There is a whole world, there is an enemy that is constantly attacking you. So you are praying and he'll let you pray. Go ahead, pray. Pray your salah. But I'm going to come to you in your salah. After your salah, I'm going to come to you again. So your mother calls you, I'm going to come to you in that. That is because of this whirlpool of constant badness. When the person is being reminded of goodness, of ikhlas, of istighfar, of his need for Allah, and he's in that good environment, you will see that a person's habits, etc. changing. I mean, how many times, I don't know if you guys have seen this, I've had this myself recently, a brother who got married, he's from Birmingham, Riva, early 20s, and we did his nikah and his father came. I spoke to his father and said, since he's become Muslim, what do you think? He goes, before he was a handful. Ever since he's become Muslim for the last four or five years, I've just, just seen just goodness from him. And now we've actually got a relationship. And now I'm here at his wedding. He goes, I would have never ex- expected anything like that. Why? Because look what he's done in his life. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for his assistance. Barakallah fikum. Inshallah, we'll see you next week. Subhanakallahumma bihamdulillah.